Dr. Don Dennison served in pastoral ministry for a lot of years at a lot of churches, as well as serving in cross-cultural ministries at the denominational level for Churches of God General Conference. Um, he's been a, an adjunct professor at Weinbrenner Seminary for a long time, and he was the recipient of our 2018 Distinguished Alumnus Award at Weinbrenner. Uh, he's taught many, many sermons and many classes on all aspects of cross-cultural missions, and I'm looking forward to what he has to say with us tonight. So let's welcome Don and take it away. Uh, thank you, Katie, and I'm um, glad for those who are joining us live, as well as those who might listen in and watch a uh, recording of this. Um, just a little bit more about my story. I, I did pastor for 28 years in Illinois and Indiana um, before I came to Finley uh, to serve as director for Cross-Cultural Ministries, which is now Global Reach, and did that for 20 years. And then uh, when I stepped aside from that, um, transition into another role was serving as church and mission consultant, um, helping out local churches to evaluate their local and global outreach. And uh, in the process also did three interim pastorates in the last four years. And uh, more recently I've been writing, uh, working on some uh, missions history writing projects. So um, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, now, right now I'm in central Florida, uh, escaping the winter and enjoying where, where I am. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying where you are as well. Uh, I, I really love the topic tonight, addressing the issue of shame in a world that no longer feels guilty. Uh, I am fascinated by cultural differences. Uh, my appreciation for those differences came from my wife and I hosting foreign exchange high school students uh, entertaining uh, international university students, as well as um, ministering in 15 countries and fi on five continents over the last 25 years. Um, growing up uh, in North America, it's easy for us to assume that how we think or act, um, how we do things is the right way uh, or the best way. And we can even be guilty of reading scripture through Western eyes. And I think that when we do, we often miss out on what God wants to teach us. Um, because, um, you know, God worked through the minds of writers of the New Testament and Old Testament. Uh, they certainly didn't have Western eyes and, um, and minds. And uh, so they wrote and thought differently. Um, so in the last few years, there's been a, a growing body of work uh, in missiology, uh, which focuses on how our evangelistic message needs to become more contextualized, especially among people groups who are governed by different values than what we live by. Uh, at the same time, we know that North America has become more culturally diverse which means that we need to rethink the ways we communicate the problem of sin and the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, for years, I've been teaching that it's absolutely necessary for us to think like missionaries in order to reach our changing communities here at home. And, and so this uh, topic tonight is just one facet of that imperative. Um, I have uh, some slides I wanna share. Um, and so I'll be sharing my screen right now. Hopefully that comes across to everybody. Missiologists today have uh, identified three primary uh, types of cultures, very different types. And, and, and these three are motivated largely by either guilt or by fear or by shame. Uh, whenever someone does something wrong, and, and from a theological perspective, we use the word sin, when, when that happens, we usually feel one of three primary responses. Uh, we feel guilty in our own conscience. Uh, we feel fearful before a spiritual world uh, and we feel ashamed before the community. Now, depending upon how we feel, we seek one of three solutions. So a, a guilty person wants innocence or forgiveness. 
uh, a person who's afraid wants power to overcome that which opposes them. And a person who is ashamed or feels ashamed uh, wants to be honored. And, and so those are the three primary cultural types uh, uh, and the responses that, that people make. Compared to other cultural models that describe how a culture functions, this guilt, shame, fear model explains why a culture functions the way it does. It exposes and it expands upon the internal values. So this idea of guilt and shame, I'm gonna focus more on that tonight rather than the concept of fear. I'll say more about the fear aspect later on, but the idea of guilt versus shame has a long history in 20th century scholarship. Um, the first known mention of guilt, shame, fear was made by Christian anthropologist and linguist Eugene Nida in his book, Cultures and Customs. He said, we have to reckon with three different types of reactions to transgressions of religiously sanctioned codes, fear, shame, and guilt. So uh, he's actually writing about this a long time ago. It's not anything recent. These categories are um, theological realities. They're not just cultural descriptions. Uh, they relate to the core of problem of humanity and, and the central solutions um, uh, brings us to the cross. The whole idea of honor shame does not correct or replace any theology, but it, instead it enhances and expands our understanding of the Bible because the, the Bible was written, grew out of a culture that deals more with shame and fear than it does guilt. Psychologists in the 1960s began to write about the internal aspects of guilt and shame and anxiety. It was Dr. David Augsburger, who was professor of, uh, of psychology and counseling at Fuller Seminary. And he expounded on the categories in several of his publications, including a conflict meditation, mediation across cultures. He says, anxiety, shame, and guilt are the normal and sequential control processes that emerge in the first, second, and third years of a child's development in every culture. Uh, each culture has its own balanced and its own in, in, uh, integrative hierarchy of these internal controls. He talks about tribalistic cultures are dominated by the fear anxiety motive. Uh, individualistic cultures uh, generally seek to minimize anxiety and shame while socializing the child to have more of a guilt orientation while many collectivistic cultures generally tend to encourage a shame orientation. He said the three function together, although the intensity of each influence varies significantly from culture to culture. Uh, this graph here um, uh, reveals uh, the culture types, how they're found in, in various social structures. Um, let me just pause and ask, uh, are you able to see all of this graph? Okay, all right. Uh, we have the individualistic, which uh, the, the culture type is guilt, innocence. The animistic is fear, power. And then um, the, the shame, honor is, is collectivistic. Uh, um, in our Western culture, we're more individualistic. Um, whereas, the majority of the world is more a shame honor focused or a deal with fear and power. Um, let me um, uh, let me give you an example of what I encountered early in my cross cultural ministry uh, with uh, um, uh, how uh, I was uh, came up against this collectivistic mindset um, and, and saw such a huge difference between that. Uh, and my own individualistic way of thinking. I was visiting Bangladesh and uh, the field director was taking me and a couple other people around various churches. We were visiting quite a few churches in the afternoon. And uh, we drove as far as we could and we got out and we walked on pathways through rice paddies. Uh, and we saw in the distance a, a, a clump of trees and huts 
it was like an uh, kind of like an oasis or an island in the midst of all this agricultural area. And and um, this was um, among the tribal people. Uh, there was um, uh, a village there. And as we were walking out there uh, and we were going to be greeting them um, and, and I was uh, going to have an opportunity to speak to them, um, our, our field director said, uh, this entire village has accepted Christ. And I wanted clarification on that. I said, what do you mean their entire village has? I mean, everyone has? Yes, the, the tribal leader, the village leader, uh, in weighing the options, said it would be good for all of them to become Christian. And so they all declared their faith in Jesus Christ in mass, which, um, you know, I, I grew up and, and many of you probably grew up in a, in a culture and a context where we emphasize one's personal individual relationship with Jesus Christ. And to, and to suggest that here's a culture where the, the group leader decides we're all going to become Christian um, that was such such a um, you know a big divide from what I was familiar with, and so I sought more information about it. And and, and um, you know, can we say that that entire village had become followers of Christ? Absolutely, we can. And the key thing there is then the discipleship that takes place afterwards, uh, where individuals uh, are taught the Word of God and and uh, help to understand how to apply it to their lives. And uh, they may give allegiance to Christ because they have utmost confidence and faith in their tribal leader that this is the right way to, to go. Uh, and so the, the fact that they respect him and have faith in him, um, it's easy for them to say, we're going to follow Christ because of the, his, this guy's recommendation. But again, the discipleship aspect is, is key. So that's very different from how we approach um, you know, the mayor of Finley doesn't say everybody in Finley should become Christian. And so we automatically fall in line. And yeah, that sounds good because we respect our mayor. Um, it's just different. Uh, so you can look at this um, uh, you know, graph that um, emphasize some of these differences. Uh, we, we know that Western Christianity tends to emphasize one aspect of salvation, and, and that's the forgiveness of sins. And, and I think as a result, we neglect other facets of the gospel. And it's, it's so because historically, the two most significant voices behind Western theology, I think, are probably Augustine and Luther, who were both plagued by a sense of God's wrath toward their transgressions. So their writings, and they went to great length to explain how God forgives and how he acquits guilty sinners. Uh, the problem is that most people in the majority world cultures desire honor to cover their shame and they desire power to mitigate their fear. So those are blind spots to us in Western Christian theology. And I think it's important for us to be aware of this and learn more about this because the biblical culture was really saturated by these honor shame values. So it's not a modern concept for us to talk about this tonight or to read about it or and, and there's a, a, a really a great increase in literature coming out about this whole thing. But the other reason why it's important is that most of the unreached peoples are characterized by honor shame values. So if, if most of the people and we're talking about um, you see the graph here, 4.37 billion people, most of the people un who are unreached um, come out of this context, uh, then it's important for us to understand it and know how to communicate effectively. Um, and, and we need to think about how we um, communicate that gospel of, of more effectively. Consider we're an individual culture might be located within this triangle. Uh, the United States is more guilt-based. It's not to say that shame and fear don't play a part in that, and I'll say more about that, but we, le we tend to lean more toward uh, guilt. Whereas if you're from Central Asia, shame is uh, a bigger factor in decision-making and, and how life is governed. Now, most cultures will, to some extent, have characteristics of all three. 
But the key question is, which one is prominent or primary in one's life? Honor and shame are prominent in majority world cultures where these moral values form the operating systems of every, everyday life. Uh, people will avoid disgrace and seek status in the eyes of the community. But shame is not limited to non-Western cultures. And, and you know, this map shows you, uh, we look at North America, um, Argentina, uh, much of Western Europe, Australia, South Africa, those areas uh, are more governed by guilt. But you look at uh, so much of the world uh, where there are other factors that influence people. But the truth is that Western culture is becoming more shame oriented, um, such as you think about social media today and bullying that's going on in schools and on social media where um, people are being shamed. They feel ashamed for what they said or did or didn't do. Uh, and, and so it's something that we need to understand more and uh, certainly uh, address the issue. So why should a Westerner understand shame-based cultures? After all, this is the United States and we have our own guilt-based culture. It is our way of doing things. So why should we adapt or even try to adapt? Uh, one is the issue of global migration that has brought 40 plus million people to the United States alone who are foreign born. Um, and we have a lot of citizens in the United States uh, who were born outside the country who have become citizens. So uh, migration is a, a factor. Uh, we no longer live in a homogenous society where it's purely a guilt-based culture. Uh, we're bumping up against other cultures on a daily basis, regardless of where we live. Uh, but we also need to understand shame-based cultures if we want to read our Bible. Because again, the Bible comes out of that kind of context. Uh, and so uh, it's important that we not read into scriptures our way of thinking about culture, but try to determine, you know, what's the prevalent culture here and how do they function and what can we learn from them and their decision making. The other aspect of this issue is that if we're a human being, we deal with shame. Um, because I don't think shame is an Arab issue or an Asian issue. It's really an Adam and Eve issue. And it's something that ought to, um, we ought to think about and deal with. Uh, and learn how to communicate that uh, more effectively as we encounter other people. To some degree, every person in every culture deals to some extent with shame. It, it not, might not be as much an issue for a Westerner as it is for a Middle Eastern person, but we're still going to be impacted by it still. And Christ wants to bring healing to us in the midst of our shame. Now, if you had to draw a picture of what shame is, what would it look like? Or if you had to write some synonyms of shame, what words would you use? The difficulty is that shame is not a concrete noun, it's a social construct. It's something that's very abstract. We feel it, but it's not something we hold. Uh, this is the French artist Rodin's sculpture of Eve after the fall. How many people are in this picture? There's one. For most people in the world, shame involves that internal element, but it's also a public, a communal reality, a sense of rejection from the community. It's a low opinion of, from others. You notice several things about it. Um, what do you see in this statue, this sculpture? She's looking down, she's covering herself, she's turning away, and there's a sense that she wants to be hidden. And that's exactly what shame is. There is something fundamentally wrong with the person who needs to be hidden, and it can't be seen and it can't be exposed. 
there is a sense of internal nakedness and vulnerability. And that's really what shame is. And while that's a good definition of what shame is, or at least a good starting point, it's primarily a Western view of shame, and it's a psychological view of shame. Maybe you're familiar with Dr. Brene Brown. Uh, she's a research professor whose TED Talks on the power of vulnerability and listening to shame have attracted millions of viewers. She defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Here are some of the synonyms for the word shame. The most common in many cultures is the word face. Talk about saving face or losing face. You may be around, have known some people where they talk in those terms or the word name, which gets at this issue of shame and honor. It makes sense because of what you are known by. You ask someone, who is that? And, and the, they point to your face or, or they say your name. It's your reputation. It's how I, how other people identify you. Uh, and so these are all synonyms that um, associate with this idea of shame. And it, it suggests that um, uh, people's unworthiness. Uh, let me cite some examples. Global migration has brought to our country persons whose culture is more shame-based and issues of saving face are a greater concern. You'll recall in the wake of the tragic Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, uh, the media found the suspect's uncle. On public television, the Chechen uncle denounced his nephews. And he said this, I quote, you put a shame on our entire family, the Sarnaev family, and you put a shame on the entire Chechen ethnicity. Now, as Americans were reeling from the tragedy of the loss of human life, this uncle was more concerned about his people's shame. Avoiding humiliation was a higher priority for him. And that seems strange to us, but it's how that particular cultural group felt, but he's not alone. When Brazil lost 7-1 to to Germany in the 2014 World Cup, Brazilian fans responded, we will need to face people making fun of us the rest of our lives. And others said, I feel ashamed to be a Brazilian. Well, peer pressure and the fear of being excluded has, has always been a part of adolescence. But social media and smartphones has expanded this phenomenon into a 24-7 issue, this fear of shame. It never turns off. The, the possibility of, of shame seems inescapable with online bullying and the potential Twitter takedown. Uh, there's constant anxiety about inclusion and exclusion, but it's a, it's a, and it's a human trait to want others to think well of us. Let me cite another example. A New York Times article titled Stigma Hampers Iraqi Efforts to Fight the Coronavirus. Examine how the dynamics of shame are affecting Iraq during the pandemic. There were, there were four shame um, issues from the article. One is the shame of sickness. Uh, people uh, resist testing because they do not want their neighbors to learn they are a sick person. The stigma of illness is so deep that people avoid testing altogether. The father of a family told health workers, please don't park in front of our house. I feel ashamed in front of the neighbors. This is a difficult, so difficult for my reputation. Now, we know that from reading even the gospels that in many religious contexts, people equate sickness with sin. Think of John chapter nine. They assume the sickness is a divine punishment. And naturally, people avoid such sinners. Uh, and so in this way, coronavirus, coronavirus has a layer of religion-sanctioned uh, shame. There's burial concerns. Uh, burial practices are 
significant in collectivistic societies and contexts, where, when, and how a person gets buried is the ultimate expression of their status in the community. Iraqi culture requires family to immediately cleanse and bury the deceased body, preferably within the first 24 hours. But what happens in a pandemic where bodies are abandoned or they're lost or they're buried in mass graves? Well, they're forgotten by their family because their death cannot be properly commemorated. And so this postpartum desecration of the corpse is the ultimate disgrace. So people would rather die in their homes to ensure a proper burial rather than go to a hospital and to risk an improper burial. The third issue is fear of isolation. In collectivistic contexts, people don't want to be quarantined alone. Uh, people in Western uh, cultures are used to being alone and enjoy privacy. But in many places, in many cultures, people live with an extended family in a very small space. So solitude and privacy are not only foreign, but it's dreadful to many people. The constant company of people provides security and familiarity. And so the idea of thinking about spending 14 days in, in solitude through quarantine seems horrendous to them. And then there's protecting family honor. The risk of sickness and quarantine risks the family honor. If a person gets sick, he's no longer able to protect his wife and children, especially if he's quarantined away from the home. A similar logic would apply to women. Some families fear that a sick female relative will be removed from the house and thus be sexually vulnerable. So the surest way to preserve the family honor is to keep everyone together regardless of the health risks. So these kinds of social values hamper efforts to fight the epidemic, but expecting people to simply jettison their ingrained cultural values for public safety is really not a realistic solution because the power of shame runs deep, runs very deep. So there's gotta be ways for us to think about you know, how can we respect their culture and their way of thinking um, and not force them in the ways of thinking that uh, will be detrimental to others. In late 2016, uh, LifeWay Research asked 1,000 Americans to discover their feelings about fear, guilt, shame, and other issues. Overall, 38% of Americans say they avoid shame the most, while 31% say guilt and 30% said fear. When presenting the gospel, there are numerous plans of salvation for leading persons to a faith commitment. When I teach my uh, church and mission course at Weinbrenner every summer, uh, we explore several different classic uh, pl plans of salvation and look at some new ones that have been developed. Yet almost all of them in the United States have a singular focus. They address the problem of personal guilt by offering forgiveness of sins through a personal decision to receive uh, Christ, which results in a declaration of innocence before God. And, and so many of these faith sharing approaches in which I and previous generations have been trained have followed this approach because they fit our cultural context in the United States much more than they do other places in the world. But what approach do we take when a generation or a cultural group, group is not motivated by a desire to have guilt removed because in part they do not feel guilty. Do we ramp up the pressure to make them feel guilty when they don't? Um, do, do we just assume they're so hardened by sin that they don't feel guilty? What if those who need to hear the gospel are motivated by something else besides guilt? such as fear or shame. Uh, LifeWay research validated this trend showing that people are more concerned about their reputation than their conscience. Think about that. I wanna to suggest to you that the Bible says as much, if not more about shame and honor as it does about guilt and innocence. And if we look at, at that in a few minutes, uh, we're gonna find that uh, because we no longer live in a homogenous society governed solely by a guilt-based culture, it means we have to broaden our approach in presenting a gospel that really does communicate effectively to others. Um, 
you know, if we constantly take the guilt approach and it's, we're not making any progress, if we're not seeing results from it, maybe we need to rethink the way we do things. I mentioned about uh, the difference, you know, guilt is, shows up 145 times in the Old Testament, 10 times in the New Testament, whereas shame shows up so much more often. Uh, shame is a rejection from um, the community, a low opinion from others. And, and here in uh, Job 19 is a portrayal of Job, which uh, focuses more on shame than it does about guilt. His real problem, as he describes here in this passage, is the shame that he experienced in the context of his community. Uh, and it's a good reminder to us of how most cultures in the world experience shame. It's not just an internal subjective issue to be overcome, but it's a public objective reality for them. It's very concrete. Um, we see this in Genesis chapter three. Uh, you know, what's their response when they sin? They hid, they tried to cover themselves. So hiding and covering are trademarks of shame. They experienced it internally and personally, subjectively, but there's also a sense of alienation from God. They're banished from the garden, having lost the status they once had. That's the objective element of what shame is. So shame is a theological problem as well as a, a psychological problem. We could say it's a negative public rating. Uh, the psalmist says, you have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You've made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their heads at us. I live in disgrace all day long and my face is covered with shame. Think of Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, how the shame, um, the son's you know, shame was such a vital part of the story. Uh, and we may cover the points, but we don't necessarily see it as shame. We, 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 we may take the story and talk more about he's guilty but he's not feeling the guilt as much as the shame of his wrong decision. And then what was the father's response? He honors him. We, we tend to interpret the story that he felt so guilty for messing up his life, he came to his senses. But I, I suggest to you that shame and fear played a much larger role in this biblical world than guilt did. Um, in our American individualistic social structure. Guilt says, I deserve to be punished. But the prodigal son's social structure, where group thinking was more valued than individualistic thinking, for them, shame says, I am worthless. He was convinced he was no longer worthy to be called a son. He was convinced he was sure that he had burned all the bridges uh, to the father, no longer had any future in the family. But the father address that and, and uh, accepting him back. So honor is the most important thing in life for many people. People would rather die with honor than live with shame. Experiencing a sense of shame is the worst thing imaginable. So they'll go to great lengths to repair their honor, even if it means killing a member in the family or resorting to suicide. Uh, there's, um, we, we sometimes hear in the news about honor killings. It happens primarily in Islamic cultures, um, and we're seeing it sh show up here some because of the influx of um, Muslim populations. But there's interesting, there's now a movement in Pakistan emphasizing how dishonorable it is to conduct honor killings. And there are those who are really trying to say, this is not the right way. So honor is greater than life. If you take away their honor, you're taking away their humanity. Uh, honor is an acknowledgement of worth. And here are some synonyms that we talk about honor. And worship and glory are probably two of the most common in the Bible. Just to compare how guilt moral systems and shame-based moral systems differ, here's a summary of the two. Um, honor and shame cultures do believe in right and wrong. It's just based on ideals and relationships, not on laws and rules. Therefore, it affects one's community, not just one's conscience. 
So we see the response to shame is quite different. In a shame context, there's nothing a person can do to fundamentally change their shame state. It takes someone else from a higher status than them to come along and honor them and reincorporate them into a good standing. And that's essentially what the gospel does. That's what Jesus has done. The mission of God is to restore people from shame to honor. And we see this in scripture again and again. Uh, I won't take the time to quote these scriptures, but uh, there are propositions, there are metaphors. Um, and, and I just want to highlight the fact that, you know, there certainly are guilt, innocence, narratives in the Bible. But it's important for us, whether we're preaching the word or teaching the word, that we guard against interpreting every narrative through the lens of guilt and innocence. When shame and honor are, are obviously there, uh, taking that approach and going with that emphasis uh, is much more um, um, worthy of, of a Bible interpreter. Uh, we, we are staying true to the text if we do that. Uh, again, here's some honor, uh, metaphors of honor, shame, um, showing the contrast between the two. On the left is a typical guilt forgiveness model for presenting the gospel. God loves you, offers a wonderful plan for your life. People are sinful and condemned by God. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice for your sins. You must receive Jesus as your personal savior. You know, that um, transition is very common to us, uh, that kind of approach. But Here's a approach, uh, a method of evangelism, a plan that uh, is a model for a shame honor perspective. God values and wants to honor you as a child, but people are shameful and dishonor God. So Jesus Christ comes along, he's borne all of our shame and restores our honor, and we must give our allegiance to him to enter God's family. It's a different approach. And it's a way to connect more with persons who come from that background. Here's a brief video that um, I, I want to share with you. It gives you an overview of this topic of honor and shame. The world is a huge place with all kinds of people who look, think, and act differently. The categories of honor and shame help us understand the world culture. But what is honor and shame? Remember the pressure in high school to wear certain clothes or talk a certain way to be cool? Honor is when others respect you for observing group expectations. And shame is when people scorn you for being inadequate. We call Joe. He was an esteemed person. But after he lost everything, he lamented, My friends forgot me. I'm a stench to my own family. Even young children despise me. God has stripped my glory from me. That's shame. When the community rejects you as worthless. And remember, Cultures use many words to talk about honor, like glory, face, name, or dignity. Guilt-based cultures in the West appeal to laws of justice to define morality, but shame-based cultures in the East rely upon relationships and reputation to guide them. So think of honor and shame as a social credit rating. Since relationships and family are so important, your most valuable asset is your reputation in the community. Avoiding shame and acquiring honor is the operating system behind everyday life in non-Western cultures. That's why honor-shame cultures speak indirectly. To preserve face and harmony, talking directly can be offensive. So use words to communicate honor, not just ideas. Honor-shame cultures also focus on events, because gatherings confirm group identity. Starting on time without someone means they are not important to the group. Honor-shame cultures are also collectivistic. So what one person does affects the entire community. People get their identity from the group, not individual accomplishment. Finally, honor-shame groups are incredibly hospitable because sharing food together means community and acceptance. If honor and shame are driving forces in most cultures, what does the Bible say about honor and shame? Well, a lot. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged, for you will not suffer disgrace. My salvation and my honor depend on God. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. The Bible is covered in shame and honor because the Bible was written in an honor-shame culture. 
and many other words communicate honor and shame metaphorically. Like Ephesians 2.19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Throughout the Bible, when God saves, he rescues from shame and restores honor. After Adam and Eve said, they hid and covered themselves because they felt shame. But God set out to reverse human shame by blessing Abraham with his huge family and great name. Then Israel became lowly slaves in Egypt. But God made them a great nation, his treasured possession. Or Ruth and Naomi were destitute widows. But God used Boaz to redeem them from shame by restoring their land and giving a royal son. While David was a young boy herding sheep, God raised him up to be a king with a great name and everlasting throne. Even Jesus was publicly disgraced on the cross, but God exalted him to the heavens, where Jesus sits at God's right hand with the name above all names. Because of Jesus, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, but have honor from God. All throughout the Bible, God works to remove shame and restore honor in the human family. So how can we bless people with God's honor? It's easy. First, we eliminate shame. All people deal with shame, including you and me. We feel inadequate, deficient, or worthless for not living up to expectations. But the cross covers that false shame. Before we share God's honor with other people, we must receive it ourselves. Second, eating together with other people communicates honor and work. That is why Jesus feasted with the outcasts. Sharing a meal shows value and forms relationships. So invite people to your house for a meal or accept their invitation. Third, ease conflict. When there's a problem, keep one eye on the issue and your other eye on the relationship. Being too blunt may shame you. So use suggestions or questions to not offend. And when you must reconcile with someone, realize a verbal apology may expose old wounds, but offering a gift or meal can restore relational harmony. Finally, evangelize well. Here's the good news for people feeling shame. God wants to honor you as his child, but our sin dishonors God and brings shame. Fortunately, Jesus took our shame and restores honor. So be loyal to Jesus to enter God's family and receive his All right. And in a minute, I'll tell you where that... Uh... You can get access to that video. So how would you answer these questions? Uh, which of these feelings do you seek to avoid the most? Is it fear, is it shame, or is it guilt? Which of these desires is strongest in your life? And which do you value the most in persuading others to do what you want? Uh, there is uh, an online simple culture test, and that's uh, giving you the, the uh, address. I encourage you later to go to that. You just fill it out online, and they will, sh they will then tabulate it right away, and you will learn um, which of these three is a greater priority in your life, um, a greater role in your life. And just to let you know that when I took it uh, last time, guilt was 72%. Shame was 20% and fear was 8%. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, I'd be curious, email me and let me know what your ratio was there, okay? Uh, but it's a cool tool that uh, I've used with different groups. I've provided you some uh, resources here. There's a great website um, that gives you a lot of these ideas that I share with you tonight. It's simply honorshame.com. Um, the, um, the the third one on the list, uh, the Vimeo.com showcase honor restored. Um, in 2018, Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now Crew, they released uh, uh, Honor Restored, a, di a, vid a digital tool uh, designed to help individuals share the good news of Jesus with people who come from honor shame cultures. And that app since then has been translated into many different languages and it's used widely. Uh, the creators of it have also developed a series of training videos to help believers to better understand uh, honor shame cultures uh, for evangelistic purposes. And so all of these videos can be viewed by us. They can be downloaded for free for, uh, from their Vimeo page. 
and each video is about four minutes long, so it's not very long. Um, but they, they try to help individuals to be more equipped to, to share with confidence and clarity. Uh, and they, they address a lot of different questions about this. Um, you know, what is honor and shame and, and how do I communicate effectively? And uh, uh, how can I disciple a new believer who might come from that background and so forth? So I, uh, some of the other books, uh, the 3D Gospel Ministry and Guilt, Shame and uh, Other Cultures um, it is an excellent book. Um, it's much shorter than, I also like the Global Gospel, but it's a much longer book to work through. So uh, these are just some ideas that to help you if you wanna learn more about this. Now, one more thing before we stop and uh, take any questions. Uh, I did a, a series of four sermons back in November, 2018. I think it was um, um, on this whole honor shame approach and uh, expository sermons from these texts. These were my themes. And uh, if you, as someone who is uh, watching this, reviewing this, participating with it, uh, I'll be glad to send this to you for free if you have interest in it. Um, and if it helps you, then in your ministry, I'd be glad to offer it to you. So just send me an email, dennisond at finley.edu and I'll be glad to uh, get that to you. So um, I'll send it back to you, Katie, for uh, follow up on this then. All right, thank you, Don. Appreciate your talk tonight. I mean, personally, I found it very informative. Like I had never, you know, thought of that concept of the guilt versus the shame and all of that and just never really thought of that. So I, I really appreciated this. Thank you. So, yeah. And thank you, Dr. Cola, for joining us and Lori. <laughs> uh, Lori is a longtime friend of mine. So she's okay. calling, she's uh, listening from the Chicago area, I think. Awesome. So. I am. Actually, Pastor Dennison married us. Oh, very cool. Uh, nice. About 36 years ago. That's awesome. Good to hear your voice, Lori. <laughs> you too. It was great, actually. I enjoyed this. And the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing is recorded, by the way, too. So if you missed the beginning, you'll be able to catch it on the recording. So, <laughs> Dr. Kohler, you're muted if you want to say something. I just wonder that you consider me as a friend or not. <laughs> of course you're a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is re really excellent, excellent presentation. Um, it's a little deeper looking into it. We all have a guilt, shame, and uh, fear. All this, every Christian shares some. But coming from India, yes, I'll say yes. Uh, honor is the very important thing. Fear in nothing, <laughs> and uh, you know, guilt you overcome. But honor and dishonor is uh, very, very powerful. It's ingrained in your system. So how do you address that? Well, um, in, in my travels to other countries, you know, when I went to Haiti, um, and, and I just became exposed to this in more in recent years, the later years of my ministry and cross-cultural ministries. Um, so I, I shifted the emphasis of my messages to groups in Haiti, dealing more with the fear aspect uh, because of voodoo and, and other influences there. Uh, you see it in Brazil as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a strong desire for power to deal with the fears that they have. There's a lot of syncretism in Christianity mm -hmm. there in Brazil. Uh, when I was in India last and spoke there, uh, addressing this idea of shame and honor and realizing that it's, and you know this, whether they're from a Hindu culture or a Muslim culture background, it's very difficult for those persons to individually, personally decide to follow Christ. They yes. may, there are individuals who are secret believers, True. And, and this is not anything new. I mean, I'm reading uh, uh, story, histories of the missions of, of some of our missionaries going back 60, 70 years, and they said there were many secret believers but who were too afraid to come out and profess their faith publicly because of the pressure of their family and their yeah. village. Uh, for those who did, they were kicked out and their lives were threatened and some were even put to death because mm -hmm. they were so bold as to, to publicly profess faith in Christ as an individual. 
So in those contexts, working with village leaders or tribal leaders or family leaders, um, it's so important if they are persuaded, then uh, it's easier for everybody else to fall in line because as the illustration I gave early on, uh, when, when the, the village leader or the tribal leader says, yes. you know, we mm -hmm. want to become a Christian, uh, yeah. and we, we've decided to become Christian, everybody falls in step. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it, whether it's here in the United States or wherever we go, it's important to discern, you know, what, what's the primary motivation of these, of the persons? What do we know about their culture? Um, so it, it means it, it takes time to get to know the individual, what motivates them, what concerns them. Um, uh, Early on, when in 1995, when I became uh, director for the denomination's missions, um, it, it, this whole individualistic versus collectivistic approach impacted me in terms of how I communicated. Uh, I would tend to start off an email or a letter, getting right to the point, and you know address the topic. And I quickly learned that I need to ask, you know, how are you? How is your family? I hope you all are well. God bless Excellent. you. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and because you know, they're, they're, they're not individualistic mindsets, they're, they're connected to family and they're close knit group. And, and so you, you, um, you express concern for others in their sphere of influence before you get around to talking about what you really wanna say or ask. Um, so it's, it's, it's approaching people from the standpoint of where they are, not where we are. Uh, and so we we miss so much opportunity when we try to think that everybody needs That's to fit true. to our cultural viewpoint. I'll agree with you. Even the scripture says, God so loved the world and he came to us. Yes. <laughs> he became yes. one of us. Yes. That is the only way we can understand him and walk with him. Absolutely. So, yeah. Our culture being us, not me. Yes. You know. So me and my family serve the Lord, you know, in the scripturally, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. I really like it. I'm going to request for your sermons. I'm going to send a request to you. Send me an email. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi, Jim. Good to see you tonight. <laughs> You're me there, yeah. See you, Don. Sorry, I was late. Our uh, oh, church a uh, Thursday evening Zoom call that uh, goes quite well. And so we just finished that up a little while ago. And Good. I'll jump on here quick. So, yeah, good to see you, Don. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And, you know, like I said, it was, it was recorded, so you can always, you know, watch it after the fact here. <laughs> Should be available early next week, if not before, depending how on the ball we are on things. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. All right. Well, with that, Don, would you close us out in prayer? Be glad to. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the opportunity to connect with one another tonight. And, uh, uh, thank you for our even various backgrounds among the group that's uh, online tonight and those who will be watching later on uh, from the, the videotape. I, I thank you, Lord, that um, you loved us and you, you've come to honor us by receiving us into your family and accepting us. Though we may feel we are unworthy and certainly sin has been a barrier to a relationship with you. You are a God who has gone the extra mile, who's done everything for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And we pray that you would help us, uh, knowing that we are your people. Help us, Lord, to be able to understand others we want to communicate the gospel to, to better understand their background and culture and their mindset, even for someone who speaks the same language as us, uh, who may be of a different generation, who sees life differently than us. Help us to respect that and not assume that they're going to have the same mindset that we do or approach life or have the same values that we do. So guide us, we pray, uh, as we um, build relationships, as we serve as missionaries in our own culture, as we reach out to, to have an impact on others around us. We thank you for Weinbrenner. Thank you for its ministry, for preparing leaders to make a difference in the world. And we pray your continued blessing and guidance that uh, all of this will be to your glory and honor. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thank you, Katie, for putting all of this together. It's great to be with you all tonight. Definitely, and thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it, and we appreciate your time and sharing all that with us. So thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>